On tonight's CTV News, 100 years on, Canterbury's contribution to World War I is commemorated. The Christchurch City Council has work to do to reclaim its building consenting accreditation. And Minister Wagner continues to assert her electorate looks like her, but does it really? This is CTV News. I'm Grant Mangum. St John officially started the move back into Christchurch's central city yesterday. The charity also announced a new way to work more efficiently. It's the first port of call for thousands of Cantabrians every year when in need of urgent help, St John paramedics come to the rescue. However, earthquake damaged roads and detours have held up St John ambulances during call outs. Last night, St John officially opened its renovated Durham Street headquarters, the only St John building that survived the earthquakes. During the opening, the chairman for St John Christchurch had the chance to unveil its new operational model as part of a $7.7 .7 million rebuild plan that could one day be rolled out around the rest of the country. Um, it's international uh, best practice and St John and New Zealand has been looking at it for a while but obviously Christchurch is a great place to try it. Um, we lost six buildings in the earthquake um, so we're scattered around the city at the moment. So we've really been able to take a, a genuine Greenfields approach of um, how we meet those needs the best. St John's new way of doing things will see a central city hub base form near Christchurch Hospital. This will be a base for the charity's emergency vehicles and paramedics. The model will be adopted before 2017 when St John's administration moves to the government Justice and Emergency Services Precinct, which will also be based near the hospital. Currently St John is scattered around the city, with main bases on Wrights Road and out near the airport. This new model will increase productivity and response times by 20%. The crews will come on shift, take these vehicles out to various satellite and hubs, um, satellite stations around the city. The satellite stations could be standalone or part of medical facilities. They could even be based at the council service centres. A new clinical control centre will deploy the crews and make sure the nearest crew is sent there so Cantabrians can get the help they need. Um, the vehicles require tra uh, changing over when the crews get to the hospital. Um, somebody from that Make Ready Hub will meet them at the hospital, take it back, which frees up a, a frontline crew to, to carry on with a, with a clean ambulance to again meet the needs of our community. Until then, St John will need to make the best of a tough situation. I mean, just the condition of the roads, our crews getting, getting places. We've got these satellite stations all, all over the city where crews will base themselves and get moved on to the next job um, and moved around the city where the greatest need is to try and maintain that, which is pretty important to us. When Skirt finishes work on the road, St John's work will suddenly become a whole lot smoother. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. And since Marcus recorded that story, St John have advised us that the 20% um, improvement in the response rate is an estimate, uh, but they've yet to confirm that. Now, on Monday, New Zealand commemorated the 100-year anniversary of the start of World War I. However, yesterday, a small group of veterans remembered the fallen in Christchurch. A gathering of former soldiers to remember. We're not here to celebrate war. That's not what it's all about. We're here to commemorate the sacrifice that gave us this country we have today and the freedoms that we experience. While most of the Commonwealth paused to remember the fallen on Monday, the 100-year anniversary of New Zealand joining World War I wasn't until yesterday afternoon. Britain declared war in, with Germany on the 4th of August. And I understand it took 12 hours for that notice to come to New Zealand. It was received by the Governor, uh, Lord Liverpool, at 1pm on, on the 5th of August at Parliament. And at 3pm, New Zealand was responding uh, with a declaration by the uh, Governor at the steps of Parliament to about 15,000 New Zealanders. 100 years later in Christchurch, underneath the shadow of the Bridge of Remembrance, the bridge that thousands of soldiers marched across on their way to war, a small group of former soldiers shared a moment of silence. From an RSA point of view and from a veteran's point of view, um, it's hugely important, but we're heartened to see the, uh, the, the, the response from the community. Um, particularly in Wellington yesterday and again here in Christchurch today. While it's not big numbers, it shows that people care and people are committed to the uh, freedom that those guys gave us. Speeches were made from the Mayor and veterans before reefs were placed underneath a statue of Sergeant Henry Nicholas VC. This is about New Zealand's involvement and as uh, one of them said, you know, about our nationhood and that's what we do commemorate. We commemorate that sense of nationhood uh, that was built uh, in the trenches of, um, of Europe. Various other commemorations are planned over the next few years. 
another four years through until Armistice Day 2018, where we'll go through um, commemorating the various events um, when New Zealand got honours in the First World War. Veterans will first gather in Littleton on the 24th of October. Which was the date that the Canterbury Mounted Rifles and the Canterbury Regiment embarked on the troop ships from Littleton to join the New Zealand Echelon Force. The next big commemoration will be Anzac Day next year. Next year, of course, is important to us because it's the centenary of the Gallipoli campaign. Um, huge loss of life for New Zealand. It's not the biggest loss of life during World War I, but certainly the first one, and the baptism of fire for us. The Christchurch RSA will also mark its centenary in December next year. It was the first RSA set up in the country, with hundreds of others following its lead around New Zealand. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Building and Construction Minister Nick Smith yesterday told Christchurch Media, despite the Minister's and Mayor's confidence, the independent agency charged with accrediting the Christchurch City Council to issue consents still has concerns about the Council's ability to process each consent within 20 days. The Christchurch City Council has lost its consenting accreditation, but it hopes to get it back by December. That's if it meets the requirements of International Accreditation New Zealand. Ian says the latest audit into the Christchurch City Council's Building Control Authority has found that the Council still needs to meet nine corrective action requests. IANS has also made eight strong recommendations, which the Council will need to follow before it can be awarded that much sought after accreditation. The Mayor is happy with the City Council's progress. She says while the Council has nine corrective action requests to make, this pales in comparison to the 17 corrective action requests the Council had to make when it lost its accreditation. And IANS told us themselves that they had seen a huge change in attitude and I think that that's something we can be pretty proud of. The Mayor says the City Council has exhausted the amount of people working in consents. The inspection services are challenging when you've, when you've actually soaked up the entire pool of um, talent that exists in the country uh, and we've had to look overseas and uh, bring in inspectors from Canada. Despite local media reports, IAN says the Accreditation Authority has no issue with the amount of staff the Council has. We have never said they don't have enough staff. I know that that's one of the issues that's been reported, but their actual comment was that they may need to look at their resources. The Accreditation Authority is concerned, however, over how fast the Council can train its new staff. It also wants the Council's consenting times to be sped up. Irons is happy with the progress with issuing residential building consents, but says there still needs to be progress made with the commercial consents. Each consent should be followed up within 20 days. The current process actually doesn't really start until 10 days, 10 working days after a consent is received. And what we're suggesting is that um, the BCA should uh, look at its processes and see um, whether there might be a more efficient way of actually processing um, the consents. When there are significant complex projects, then 20 days is obviously going to be a huge challenge. The Mayor is confident the Council will have accreditation back by December. We have got um, more and more consents uh, coming in and we are improving our response rate all the time. When the City Council lost its accreditation, the Chief Executive, Mayor and Councillors weren't there during the inspection. During the latest audit, the full Council was there to meet the auditors. We've got management and governance, the Council itself, fully aligned on the need for an accredited service. The full audit report is available on the Council's website. Over the past year, it spent $9 million overhauling its consenting department. The Council now has 50 more staff working on consents than this time last year. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Coming up, the battle is on for the Christchurch Central seat. Every Saturday evening at 8 o'clock, we screen a riveting and educational documentary, ranging from history to music, culture to religion, and everything in between. Saturday night documentary, 8 o'clock, right here on CTV. It's Canterbury. Hi, I'm Steve and welcome to Carpet Kingdom. At Carpet Kingdom we stock a massive range of carpets and we're also the largest vinyl stockers in the South Island. And not only do we have an excellent range in store, but you can purchase our stock online. We offer free measuring quotes, we have our own installation team, 
We ship nationwide, so come on down and see us at Carpet Kingdom. 312 Wilsons Road in Waltham, just off Bryham Street, or visit us online at carpetkingdom.co.nz. Action Removals, offering short or long-term storage facilities, full packing services, comprehensive rates, all fully insured and with six vehicle sizes to choose from. Earthquake repairs? Action Removals pack, move, store and return your valuable possessions stress-free. Action Removals, a family business that has been operating in Christchurch for over 10 years. Action Removals, your one-stop removal service on time, every time. 0800 222 526. Come in and meet the locals at the Bush Inn Centre. Whether it's to grab a coffee on the go or to catch up with a friend over lunch or dinner, the Bush Inn Centre is the perfect place. With our unique range of shops, you'll find everything you're looking for and more. Our friendly locals are always happy to help. We have plenty of parking at the Bush Inn Centre, making your shopping experience just a little bit easier. So come in, meet the locals and shop Bush Inn. You'll find us on the corner of Rickerton and Waimari Roads. Al Jazeera News, international news right off the satellite bringing you up to the minute coverage of world events. Al Jazeera News, weekday mornings at 6 o'clock, right here on CTV. It's just over a month until the general election. Minister Nikki Wagner scraped through to take the Christchurch central seat in the 2011 election, but is she set to take the seat again this time? Emma Cropper caught up with the top contenders for the seat. The race is on for who will take Christchurch central seat in this year's election. Currently held by Nikki Wagner, Parliament's newest minister outside of Cabinet. Um, I've worked really hard in that area. I know a lot of those people. Um, I think the government's done a really good job, um, particularly in Christchurch. We've really uh, supported local institutions. We've put um, resource in that perhaps we'd never have before. She narrowly won the seat in 2011. A draw on election night, she ended up winning by 47 votes after the special ballot was counted, proving every vote matters. But so far, 822 voting packs sent out in the Christchurch Central electorate this year have been returned to the sender. But Minister Wagner doesn't believe that will make a difference. There's always a huge flux and change. And of course, about 40% of the electorate is actually a new area now because of the change of the central city, where the numbers of people, there used to be about 10,000 people living within the four avenues. And now there's only 2,000, but I'm still there. I'm still there. Labor's candidate Tony Milne isn't taking his chances taking to foot and meeting voters. So every vote does make a difference, it's why we're knocking on so many doors. And his message for locals leading into this year's election. It's everyone's legal responsibility to enrol to vote uh, and I'm out encouraging people to get on the roll to make sure that they can have their say in this election. Tony Milne's made contact with more than 8,500 people in his electorate. And people say to me that you know, they're working hard, they're playing by the rules, but they can't get ahead at the moment because of housing costs, rent costs, power prices, uh, lack of EQC, insurance resolution, issues around flooding in Beckenham and the Flockton Basin. And I'm saying that I'm going to be a strong local voice on those issues. With flooding becoming a pressing issue in Christchurch, Tony Milne is hoping to make progress on Christchurch is housing crisis. Almost 7,000 are homeless in the city and Mr Milne believes the lack of supply is putting pressure on rents. It's a bit of a dead zone at the moment. There are a few things happening but we have to get people living in there, living in quality affordable homes. Minister Wagner is hoping to gain the key young voters, believing the opportunities are endless for the young generation in the city. And I look at the young people coming through and the fact that we now have an innovation precinct uh, where the Vodafone connects them into the global network where they can train young people, where we have a graduate uh, technology school next to CPIT. And I just think of all the exciting things that are going to happen in that city as it rebuilds. Minister Wagner believes making the city strong, sustainable and safe will ensure it's future-proof for the next 140 years. What we want out of a new city, and we're really for fortunate that um, 
most of the money is going to come from insurance, government support and investors. Um, what we really want is a stronger, safer city, that's the bottom line, but we want it to be sustainable, we want it to have really good public places, we want it to be vibrant, we want it to be people friendly and we're seeing that happen. Minister Wagner's confident she'll win next month's election. As she says, the electorate bears a striking resemblance to her. I've made a joke that I'm the only MP that has an electorate shaped after it because it's got legs and a hat and arms and all sorts of things. And um, so that's been a bit of fun. However, no one will know where the vote will go until election night. It could be a blue seat, maybe red or even green. Emma Cropper, CTV News. Settling insurance claims from the Canterbury earthquakes is picking up pace. Making progress on unsettled claims, New Zealand's Insurance Council has topped the $12 billion mark of Canterbury earthquake claims. 80% of commercial claims and 66% of residential claims have been fully settled. News Talk ZB reports the number taken from the first quarter would take another 11 years for the claims to be settled, but the recent quarterly figures show a decline to just take six years. The Insurance Council says they have been settling 17 residential claims every day. The Insurance Council's Chief Executive Tim Grafton says that's $11 million a day to get Cantabrians back into homes and enabling businesses to move forward. The Insurance Council have recorded a 20% drop in the number of customers undecided with no offers. Mr Grafton believes it represents the substantial effort by insurers to progress claims that may have been previously stuck. Labor has big plans for their new policy targeting youth employment. Labor is looking out for the rising generation. A $183 million scheme to get every person under the age of 20 getting an education, training or working. 75,000 New Zealanders between 15 and 24 aren't earning or learning. Labor believes that will soon change with the youth employment package. We don't think anyone under 20 should be outside of education, training or work. We're committing to that goal and we're putting the resources in to make it happen. 70% of school leavers don't go into tertiary study. Grant Robertson says while it's important to support students going into further study, it's important to support young trade workers as well. While, while we want to have as many people as possible at university, we've probably underdone the support for getting into a trade. And a trade's a really lucrative career for a lot of people. I'd like to see more young New Zealanders into that. Hoping to get young New Zealanders off the dole and into full-time work, Labor will give over $9,000 to get 18 and 19 year olds into apprenticeships. It's one of our policies is to allow the payment for the doll for 18 and 19 year olds to be converted into a subsidy for apprenticeships. So that's actually to give those employers a little bit of extra money to take on people rather than those people just languishing on the doll. The aim for Labor is to get 12,000 opportunities for young workers over the next four years. Grant Robertson says local businesses are eager to get involved. Christchurch's Littleton Engineering currently has 14 apprentices. Grant Robertson is excited to be helping companies help young workers. It'll especially help small businesses who often struggle to take apprentices on if they don't have a lot of orders or they're, they're struggling themselves. This policy will really help them say, yep, we can afford to have an apprentice or two apprentices right through the year. Labor's Grant Robertson says the national government's boot camps have a reoffending rate of 83%. Labor plan to scrap the initiative and do things a little differently. There's a lot of individual programs out there at the moment, but we think this brings them together and it focuses on the group that most needs assistance when they're leaving school and maybe they don't have a plan for the future. So we think our plan's more targeted, it's more focused and it provides a range of options for people. Providing Labor wins a September election, the youth employment package will be in place by the end of their first term. Joel Batista, CTV News. The alleged Thai takeout vandal who was named and shamed on Facebook has been arrested. Christchurch police have confirmed a 20-year-old male has been arrested at his home in relation to a vandalism attack on Thai container. 
Early Saturday morning, the takeaway was broken into, cameras were destroyed, and the kitchen was flooded. The owner of the Thai container restaurant posted footage of the alleged vandal on Facebook. The initial post was shared more than 500 times, and a name was provided to the owner within 30 minutes. After an attempt to meet with the vandal failed, owner Ren Bao named and shamed him, posting personal details on Facebook, including the vandal's name, occupation and address. The arrested man has been granted bail and will appear in court tomorrow charged with burglary. In the last three and a half years, Thai Container has been vandalised four times. Owner Ren Bao hopes the ordeal will deter vandals from attacking his business in the future. What do you think of the power of social media then? I think it's fantastic if it can be um, if it can be used in a resourceful manner like that, and people can communities and people can pull together not only to help um, name and shame, as it's been called, um, but also to keep an eye out. I mean, this acts as a, a real good deterrent. It's very similar to what they do on other TV shows like Police 10-7, where there's a name and a suspect. CTV News will have more on this tomorrow. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Coming up, local performers are wowing crowds in Scotland. Southern Newsweek is an Otago-based news bulletin. Produced locally in Dunedin, it's your chance to catch up on everything that's happening in the community. Southern Newsweek, Saturday at 6.30pm and repeated Sunday at 10am, right here on CTV. Welcome to Caltex Redwood. We're a family-owned business proudly supporting our local community. We're open 24-7 for fuel and shop goods and we have an amazing team of people ready to help you. Save at least 6 cents per litre using AA Smart Fuel Cards. We also offer great value on our LPG bottle fills. We have a full workshop and Bridgestone tyre centre. Our mechanics and tyre technicians will get your car sorted. Caltex Redwood. We're just down from St Bede's on Main North Road. Caltex Redwood. What drives you? Are you looking for more from your local channel? CTV are online. Our latest listings, on-demand shows, programme information. All on the CTV website. We'll see you there. Located at the foot of the Port Hills, Berrymead Golf offers a spectacular location for any occasion. Make a dream wedding a reality with private use of our green function room, outdoor garden courtyard, large marquee and stunning gazebo. Or for your next conference, enjoy the relaxed atmosphere of Berrymead Golf, offering a private, spacious conference room with special deals to make any break a true break. All with customised catering from the WOW Cafe. Berrymead Golf, 50 Berrymead Park Drive, right next to the Berrymead Heritage Park. Could be Europe in Concert. A new fantastic international artist performing every week. Saturday evening at 7 pm, right here on CTV. Local athletes have proven themselves on a world stage at the Commonwealth Games, but now it's time for local performers to do the same. It's the largest arts festival of its kind, and this year it's Kiwis that are taking it by storm. More than 200 are performing in six different art, music and theatre festivals in Edinburgh this month. At least 12 New Zealand shows are running during this year's Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Over the course of the month, more than 300,000 shows will run across hundreds of venues. This show, Generation of Z, starting here in Christchurch. An interactive play where audiences witness a zombie thriller. They're performing to sell out crowds each day. I think it's going to go off. I think people will want to come and see it. And as I say, it's uh, unusual and you know engaging. So yeah. Haka, a show by New Zealand Kapa Haka groups, Te Wakahuia and Te Whanau Apanui, is performing for hundreds each day. The performers are also taking part in the Edinburgh military tattoo, along with dozens of dancers from Canterbury, being seen by more than 220,000 people and broadcast to millions. Time now to check out your regional weather. Good evening Canterbury, let's take a look at the weather around the region. First in Timaru, Tamuka and Geraldine 11. Methvin, Ashburton and Rakai 11. Starfield, Leeston and Ralston, you hit 11 degrees today. Lincoln and Christchurch, 11 also. And looking at Akadawa, they've had the low of the region again today on 10 degrees. 
in the Waimakariri district. Rangiora, Kaipoi and Amberley there as well hit 11. Moving north to the Hurunui district, Colverton, Hanmer Springs and Cheviot had the high of the region with 12 and Kaikoura hit 11 today. And looking ahead for tomorrow in Timaru, mostly fine for your Thursday with gusty westerlies easing and high cloud breaking during the day. Tonight's low 4, tomorrow's high 14. In Ashburton a fine but windy day ahead with high cloud and increasing sunny periods. An overnight low of 4 degrees and a high of 15. Christchurch high cloud and gusty mild west to northwesterly winds are expected, hitting an overnight low of 4 degrees and a high of 15. And in Kaikoura, high cloud and increasing sunny periods later as strong westerlies gust all day, hitting an overnight low of 4 and a high of 15 degrees. And in other areas around the region, Tamuka and Geraldine expect cloud with a high of 14. Methvin and Rakaia a high of 14. Darfield, Leiston, Ralston and Lincoln can expect to hit a high of 15 degrees. Over in Akadawa they look set to steal the high of the region on 16. Rangiora, Kaipoi and Amberley, cloudy with a high of 15. And further north, Colverton, Hamner Springs and Cheviot expect to hit 12 degrees. Looking ahead for Canterbury, strong gusty, very cold southwesterlies developing early on Friday morning, with a brief period of wintry showers, some hail and sleet is possible. Showers clearing for a time during the morning, but a few scattered light hail or sleet showers returning during the afternoon and evening, with temperatures cold enough for snow flurries to 200 metres. Showers will be clearing at night and winds easing out. Any early cloud clearing and weather becoming mostly fine and sunny on Saturday, with moderate westerly winds and cold temperatures. Expect it to be frosty on Saturday night. Fine and sunny on Sunday with cool northeasterlies at first, but milder northwesterly winds freshening during the afternoon and evening. Milder northwesterlies and high cloud at first on Monday, much colder southwesterlies developing during the afternoon and evening with periods of rain, snow lowering to 200 metres. Wintry showers of hail and sleet clearing during the day on Tuesday and snow flurries above 200 metres clearing also. Expected to be very cold with fresh gusty southwesterlies dying out. Expect heavy frosts on Tuesday night as well. And that's your region's weather for this Wednesday. And that's CTV News for Wednesday. I'm Grant Mangan. Good night. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.